So, I work in an advertising agency called Forsman and Bodenfors. Uh, we're a relatively small agency from Sweden, which is kind of, I realized when I looked at this map that you can hardly see your guy. We're kind of as far away from your guy as you can get. Today I'm going to be talking about how we're trying to build a world-class advertising agency, or maybe even the best advertising agency in the world, and how we're trying to do so through an idea or a sort of way of organizing ourselves that we think is the ideal way of, of, of running an advertising agency um, in order to make sure that the creative output is as good as possible. I've called this talk today Life Without Creative Directors, the Forsman and Bodenfors way. Without creative directors, but with a lot of creative direction. I'm going to show you what I mean by that, hopefully, over the next hour or so. So, my name is Samuel Åkesson, and it's, I'm a creative director. Well, I'm actually an art director. Now, for some people, this is slightly confusing. I've worked in advertising for over 15 years, and I've worked in big agencies with big campaign, won big awards. So, really, by the way that the, the, the industry is structured, by now, surely I should be a creative director. Something is wrong otherwise, but hopefully nothing is wrong. I think the idea here is that there are no creative directors whatsoever in our agency. At Forsman and Budenfors, we don't work that way. And we haven't ever had any creative directors. Uh, the agency has been going for quite a while now, and it's been working okay. Still, we've, we've won a lot of awards. This is kind of to show what sort of, you know, relatively objectively say something about the way we've um, uh, performed over the last few years. So we won a lot of Lions in Cannes and this sort of stuff, Agency of the Year at the One Show, uh, Independent Agency of the Year in Cannes Lions. Our directors club, same thing, and, and, and really this is something that we were very proud of, of course. We were, we, was the, we were the most awarded agency in the world in 2014. So we're doing something right, surely. Let's look at what that might be, and um, I'm not going to sort of... I'm going to be quite transparent, hopefully, with the way we're working, and I'm very happy for you to do exactly the same. How do we actually work, then? Well, you kind of have to start with the way everyone else works. Um, it's quite interesting, really, because we talk so much in the advertising industry about the importance of our clients uh, being brave, to dare to do things. Uh, we say that this is kind of, in order to do good work, you need brave clients. But the truth is that the advertising industry is not brave at all. And in many ways, we've been choosing the, the straight and narrow road for a very long time now, and we haven't really taken any risks whatsoever. We've, kind of built the whole industry on, on an idea that has been going for a very long time now. We've built this industry on the idea of, of pyramids, the sort of human tradition of building pyramids. And we've, we've built these sort of structures, and, and it looks pretty much the same everywhere in the world, in most agencies, whether it's a big agency or small. You might not be as many people in a smaller agency, but it's still the same all over the world. And, it's a structure that really was created sometime between the First and Second World War in, in New York at Madison Avenue. Uh, I mean, by now, that's about 80 years ago. Something, maybe something happened in the 60s, and there was this creative revolution, and, and old men like these, this is Dale Doyle, Burnback, DDB, they, you know, they set up a slightly different system, but it really not that much changed. We're still working according to the way that these men in this black and white photograph decided that we should all sort of set up our agency. We still believe that they had the right idea about how to create the best creative output on agency. They built their idea on, on, on ideas that have been going for a long time. Really, we're working according to how this guy set up the way of building an organization. Um, it's kind of based on how Napoleon built an army. And I don't know about you, but to me it seems really strange that in an industry that is all about change, we are somehow so afraid of, of any kind of change. We just stick in this way of working. So we decided with our agency that we're going to try to work a little bit differently. We, we struggled really to see the point of these sort of hierarchies. Um, how are they supposed to help the creative process? We, we kind of decided to just get rid of them, and, 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 and in doing so, we have to get rid of a lot of titles and a lot of things that come with that. This is the, the way we structure ourselves instead. It's completely flat structure, and um, it's also a structure that allows for many more creatives, uh, relatively speaking. I have the numbers in front of me here. 
We're about 130 people today, 64 of which are creative, so someone figured out that's 49%. I think those numbers aren't co really correct anymore, but we're roughly that size. And we're kind of not just structured flat, we're also quite sort of mixed up. This is what it looks like in our office, by the way. Uh, we don't have any departments or the idea of people sort of doing different things. Everyone sits together because we all work together, because we're all trying to do the same thing. It's very much built on the idea of a, of a team and a, and a sort of team spirit, I suppose. We, we don't have a manual or, or some kind of book that sort of you have to read the rules, but if there was any, one rule that we write down, I think it's the idea of responsibility, that everyone is responsible for the quality of the work. You're not, you can't rely on someone else to, to take that responsibility, someone else to decide whether something is good or not someone else to decide whether you should do it or not do it. If everyone is willing to and ready to take that responsibility, then we found that we can move much quicker and we can also produce much, much better work. It's a flat structure, so, so who decides? You know, that's, that's a valid question. The, the whole point of creative directors is that someone makes decisions. So <coughs> who's making those decisions with us? Well, with us, it's the team, really. It's all about the team. The team is part of the process from the very beginning to the very end. The team gets the brief, meets the client, the team uh, figures out what, what to do and presents the work. The team has complete responsibility throughout the whole process. This means that everyone in the team needs to be good at things they don't usually sort of do according to their <coughs> working title. We try to make sure that everyone if you're a creative, you also have to be very good at strategy. If you work in strategy, you have to be very good at creativity. We can't really, we can't afford to separate those things into different departments. We found that if you're, if you stop thinking that you're, <coughs> you're one thing or the other, you also stop sort of <coughs> limiting yourself. So it makes sense to try to work this way. When you have this, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> when you have this, <clears throat> um, how's my voice? Is that right? <clears throat> <clears throat> Hang on. Can you hear me? <clears throat> is that right? Is that okay? Or is it off? I think I have my voice. Let's try this again. <clears throat> okay, let's try this. I'm sorry. I caught a cold on the plane and it's typical, but let's try to do this. <clears throat> so, if we yes, thank you. This means that all the creatives have very close relationships to the clients. And we think that's also a very important part of the way we work. I mean, everyone knows that the closer relationship you have to someone, the more you trust this person, the more likely you are to do something good together. So <clears throat> all the creatives have very direct and close relationships to our clients. And it often means that we build very long client relationships. Our longest client relationship has gone for 26 years by now. But I suppose the question remains, who is the creative director? Who decides? How do we actually do it? Who makes sure that the, good, the work is good enough? Well, there's sort of several answers to that question, but I think the main reason and the main thing is what we call the floor. Now, <coughs> this is really a sort of remain from the days when we worked very much with print work. And it was much easier back then. <clears throat> you would simply put all the work down on the floor so everyone in the agency could walk around and you see what's going on and you start talking about it. That's the floor. Of course, today, it doesn't really work the exact same way. All the work is in print work. All the work can't really be sort of simplified into one A4 paper to put on the floor. But <clears throat> we still have the same idea of 
trying to show everything that you're working on constantly, trying to make sure that everyone else in the agency knows exactly what you're working on. So <coughs> this is a very sort of typical everyday situation in our office. <coughs> the team is completely responsible for, for the work. <coughs> they also are responsible to make sure that you've checked your work with everyone else or as many as possible in the agency. So you want to hear what everyone else is saying. And whatever, and regardless of what everyone else is saying, it's still your call, but you have to listen. So in this picture, there's no creative director, but there's a lot of creative direction going on. This is my colleague Sidla on the right, and I don't know what she's talking about. She has some ideas for a campaign. She's put it on the floor, and she just says, come on, everyone, you've got to listen. This is what we're doing. <coughs> it's a very sort of everyday situation at Forsman and Boden Fors, and the yellow circle here is really our creative director. Everyone is a creative director. It means that you're a creative director from the day you start in the agency. So whether you just work for one day or you work for a very long time, you have the same responsibility and you have you're as much say in <clears throat> everyone else's work. So do you want to talk five minutes? No, I, I, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, okay. thank you. Mm. If it's okay with you, I'm sorry, but is it all right? Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> We found that this way of working really, you know, this is a bit of a silly slide really, but it makes us better, you know? Everyone is a little bit better than they are on their own. <clears throat> this idea of team spirit is very important at Forsman and Bodenfors. When I talk about a team, it's actually maybe a bit different to what you mean when you talk about a team in an ad agency. We don't have fixed teams. We don't have situations where one copywriter and art director, <coughs> for instance, constantly work together. It changes from uh, project to project. So <coughs> it's set up in the way that <coughs> on each client you work with, you have a fixed team. But you probably work on three, four, or five different clients, and you will be in a different constellation in each one of those clients. <coughs> Which again <coughs> means that all your sort of ideas and thoughts constantly, naturally shared through the agency, and everyone is quite <coughs> sort of involved in each other's work. I'm sure that all of you who are creatives, who work as creatives here, you know that whenever you sit down to start working on something, you spend the first half hour anyway talking about other stuff, and for us it often means that you talk about stuff, <coughs> the stuff you're working on for some other clients. And often the feedback you get in that first half hour with Someone who isn't in that team is the most important feedback you ever get throughout the process. So it's very important to mix things up this way. And it sounds so easy, I think, when I sort of say what I say. But it's actually a little bit difficult to work this way. It requires a lot from you. Um, it's very sort of different to what might seem sort of like the most logical or, or normal way of working as a creative. The first thing really that differs from other agencies, I think, is that you have to, <coughs> you have to really listen to everyone else's opinion, and that's tough. You have to show your work before you're happy with it, and you have to have someone, a junior creative who's only worked for one week, come in and tell you why it's not good. That's tough, but you have to listen. And you have to listen and take that in, and you can't really have some kind of vanity and think that I'm not gonna take that feedback in, uh, that's, that's part of the process, and, and it, it applies to everyone, really. It's an important point, that really, what I just said, that you have to listen to someone who just came in a couple of days ago. <clears throat> From the very beginning, everyone has to be part of the process, and you, you can't think that just because someone worked 30 years, and their initial quick feedback on your work is going to be more relevant or valuable. <coughs> it will come with all the experience that comes with that feedback. Of course, it's super valuable, but it's also very interesting to hear what someone says who's only been working for a few days, say. So by mixing that up and getting all those inputs into the process rather than just the one input from the one creative director, it hopefully and probably changes the outcome of, of, of your work as you, as you move on. Um, 
there are, of course, a lot of creative directors out there that are really good. This, this, this is not the point, you know. I think there's fantastic creative directors, and I think in other ad agencies where you've set up with that sort of pyramid, maybe that's working and maybe that's good. But we believe that it's a mistake to stop doing what you're good at. And that's often what happens because <clears throat> as you get better as a creative, or as, not really actually as you get better, as time moves, you're sooner or later going to have someone telling you, you should become a creative director now. And it's really a completely different job from being a creative, uh, especially at bigger agencies, and especially if you're further up the pyramid we looked at, if you're a chief creative officer, that's, that's a completely different job. It's got nothing to do with coming up with ideas. And we don't believe in wasting talent in that way. <coughs> These are some pictures from our office. And it's kind of actually, kind of important in a way. Um, that we enjoy going to work, they have a really sort of nice and, and, and enjoyable work environment because if you, if you remove the factor of fear in the office of someone else <clears throat> making a decision over your head or behind your back, then you know that you can trust everyone and if you all trust each other then you're more likely to be able to solve, solve the problem and that's really what it's all about, solving problems. So, <coughs> we find that it's, um, it's easier in a way to, to, to solve an idea if everyone is just true to the problem and remove all the other sort of problems of politics and ideas of who's going to think what about this job. We've created this sort of <coughs> structure to be as efficient and lean as possible. We are roughly this. We're roughly 60 creatives in the agency, we have roughly 40 clients, and we create sort of 200 campaigns per year. It's a high output, and it's only possible because of this way of organizing ourselves. I'm going to show some work now, and I'm so happy because that's going to leave my voice for a little bit. We're going to look at some stuff. Because let's look at what happens when you work this way that we do. <coughs> Well, I'm just going to pause this for a second because this is a campaign we did in 2013 that many of you have probably seen. It was very successful. <coughs> but I thought I'm going to try to give you a little bit of background um, and, and show you a little bit more from this campaign that a lot of people haven't seen. Like I said, it was launched in 2013. But really, our work started in 2010. <coughs> we got the, the global uh, brief for Volvo trucks. They were about to launch a series of new trucks. <coughs> which is a big deal in the truck industry. Unlike cars, where you r r launch maybe two, three new models a year, trucks are launched maybe every 15 years. It's, it's a huge deal. Now we're finally launching one truck, and Volvo's launching, I think, four or five a series of trucks. So we started looking at this brief, and the first thing we saw that it's an extremely scattered target group. It's very, very difficult to reach this target group. <coughs> You're looking at fleet owners that buy maybe 200 trucks. The sort of lone ranger, the, one, the man who owns his own truck and that's his small business, and the ones that buy thousands of trucks, Carlsberg, Tesco, they don't care about trucks, they just need them, and they buy in huge bulk. <clears throat> but all these buyers also have a lot of influences around them, a lot of people having opinions about these trucks. Firstly, of course, you have the, the drivers themselves. But around the driver, you have family and friends. Family who's worried about, oh, you know, the drivers being out in trucks all day, so on, the, on the roads, it's dangerous, there's got to be a safe truck. Friends who think it's really cool with trucks and want it to be a really cool truck. And people have a lot of opinions on trucks. <clears throat> so we've got the target group like this, was realized very soon, extremely difficult to reach on a, on a on a small budget because we didn't have all this money, we had very little. We had to figure out a way of doing this. <coughs> so we came up with a, <coughs> a strategy for this campaign that really was kind of about going as wide as possible but hitting tight. And by that we mean <coughs> trying to reach as many people as possible, but making sure that out of those people, 
<coughs> the ones that make the decisions really pick up on the key ingredients of our campaign. We started this in uh, 2012. It took about two years to show anything, any work. And the first thing we did was this. So the stunt we're trying to do is uh, two Volvo trucks speeding down the highway towards a tunnel. And I have to walk across a line before they come to the tunnel. Because basically, mm, okay. if I don't finish walking across the line, the mid part between the tunnel will hit the line, it'll pop, and I will fall. In the event that we do have an accident, it'll be myself or Robin that will obviously call for assistance. So what do you think of this stunt? It's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. I've highlined much higher than this before. Um, I've highlined on longer lines, and I've highlined in harsher winds. But I've never slacklined moving forward before. Too far apart, the rope breaks, too near together, she falls off. I try not to let very much go through my mind. It's better to just focus on walking and getting to the anchor. This was at the end of 2012, and uh, in 2013 we kept going with, with what would now be sort of the live test series, as we decided to call it. The next uh, truck to be launched was a extremely robust truck, very, very strong. And uh, this is what we did uh, to launch this one. Hello, my name is Klaus Nilsson, president of Volvo Trucks. I've learned that when you want to make a YouTube hit, you need a hook at the beginning of the film. And here it is. This is a hook from the new Volvo FMX. Made of cast iron, and it holds up to 32 tons. That's far more than this, so you don't need to worry. In fact, you don't need to worry about anything. The new Volvo FMX is the most robust truck we've ever made. This truck also have, um, yeah, thank you. Uh, unusually high ground clearance. The, the distance between the ground and the bottom of the truck is, I think, about 30 centimeters. 
so we decided to try to show that in an interesting way, and this is what we did. Hello, I'm Roland Sanson, technician at Volvo Trucks. I have been working with the ground clearance of the new Volvo FMX, and very proud to say it's fantastic. We have a stiff plate protecting all bikes and parts, and we have positioned airspring members and air bellows higher up. This means 300 mm ground clearance, just a little bit more than my head. If you want more information, please go to volvotracks.com. Thank you. We did a couple of more of these uh, from this live test series, and it all sort of added up to, to, to increasing Volvo Trucks fan base. Uh, we, I have some figures here. I think you know it, a lot of stuff happened during this this year. We we created a platform from from which to speak, so we kind of removed this problem of having a, a, a difficult and scattered target audience. We we spent a year gathering the target audience by doing these films, and and that sort of set us up for. Uh, the next and, and what would be eventually be well it would be the final uh, live test, which was to showcase the, the dynamic steering, as they call it, and this is what we did. We started off like this. How many horsepower? It says 540 there, I think. Got you, yeah. So they're more powerful than I look like. So with this stunt, we will demonstrate steering precision and directional stability. Got you. Uh, we're going to drive forward, of course. No. Oh. We will uh, drive backwards. So what will happen is that I will demonstrate on these two model, model trucks. So the trucks will be placed closely together and you will be standing on the side mirrors, one foot on each mirror. Right. The trucks will move backwards. After a while, they will slowly separate, and you will perform one of your famous splits with one foot on each side mirror. On each side mirror of each truck? Yes. And they're going to open up? They're going to open up slowly, so you have plenty of time to perform the split. Yeah, but wait a second. I mean, if they keep on opening up, I can fall down yes, to the ground. Yes, but so they have after a while, they will stop opening up, and they will keep the distance. OK. Thank you, Jan yeah. Inge. Thank no you problem. so much. It was great. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Let's go and Yeah, drive. let's go. OK. I heard you went to a flamenco bar the other day. Was it good? Amazing. I would like to go. When will we finish the shooting if I'm not dead? Who can say where the road goes, where the day flows, only time. And who can say if your love grows as your heart shows? at the end of uh, uh, 2013, November the 14th, we could finally release the last stage of this three-year project that we started in 2010, and the final stage looked like this. I've had my ups and downs, my fair share of bumpy roads and heavy winds. That's what made me what I am today. Now I stand here before you. What you see is a body crafted to perfection. A pair of legs engineered to defy the laws of physics. And a mindset to master the most epic of splits.
thank you. Um, people did really like it. Uh, we it, it was 110 million views on YouTube, roughly 8 million shares online. Uh, but also, which is kind of interesting, we had about uh, 60 million views on different spoofs and so on in the, in the next sort of six months. So we got a lot of help from other people. Uh, it's impossible to count views nowadays, as you know, but we're very happy with the amount of views people liked our films and they watched that. There were about 20,000 editorials earned uh, with an earned media value of 170 million US dollars. Yeah, but you know what it's like with these numbers, but yeah, it sounds good. I think it's probably true, someone figured out. These guys made it, Bjorn and Sofia. No one is the creative director, as you can see. Van Damme also made it, he was quite important. I'm going to show you um, something we did uh, about six months ago. This is a campaign we did for H&M. Uh, it was the, uh, the first uh, global, or, well actually it was the first brief that we got for H&M. It was last year and it was a global campaign where they were going to, uh, they needed us to help their, launch their garment collecting program. So it's a recycling program that H&M set up. It was aimed sort of well, had a worldwide audience. Uh, it was a global brief, but again, very much similar to the uh, the Epic Split campaign. Uh, there was very little, surprisingly, with H and M, very little uh, media budget. The idea was to do something online. Now we couldn't just, because you can't repeat the Epic Split thing. We had to do something else. So we did something else. I'll show you, and I'm going to explain a little bit about it after watching this first ad. <laughs> Brown shoes after six. Wear a hat indoors. Wear a short skirt after 40. Wear a short skirt if you're a man. Try too hard. Don't try it all. Dress like a girl. Dress like a man. Dress like a teen. Stand out. Blend in. Mix prints. Mix pink and red. Show your panty line. Go commando. Cover up. Show it all. Be trashy. Be neat. Wear pink. Wear blue. Wear yellow if you're blonde. Wear red if you're a redhead. Wear socks and sandals. Look fake. Look chic. Look shake. Be a princess. Be boring. Take a stand. Be uniform. Be liberated, be old, be new. There are no rules in fashion, but one. Recycle your clothes. about recycling clothes, breaking rules in fashion, you know, yeah, it's a, it, and it's a nice ad, and, and it does a good job, but really, um, the idea here was, was um, it's almost like, a, it was almost like a, an idea about a, a PR campaign, really, what we just watched, um, because to get this main story across, we really decided on telling a lot of small stories and maximizing the value of those and making the campaign as efficient as possible. So, every person that, that is in the film that you saw, um, they are there and chosen very specifically to... Uh, represent a, uh, a specific PR category in different regions, because it's a global campaign, different regions of the world and different networks. Uh, I'll show you a few examples. This here is um, Tess Holliday. She's a body positive activist. Uh, she's the largest plus size model uh, to be signed to a mainstream modeling agency. You know, she was only in the film for three seconds, but it generated a lot of um, uh, PR or activity um, online, and, and we got a lot of more out of it than those three seconds in the film. Same thing goes for this guy. Um, the hashtag that he's holding up, it's, it's actually quite a big movement in Turkey, or was at the time. Uh, men came together, to, and men wore miniskirts, and they held up this hashtag and showed it in social media to put emphasis on uh, the female clothing should never be an excuse for sexual harassment. So this was a part of a sort of big movement that was going on in Turkey at the time. Uh, and we used this to put this in our ad to show our support and to also to get maximum publicity around this case. Uh, this is Pardeep Singh. He's a Sikh sartorialist. Um, he uh, made a big deal of sort of normalizing the, the idea of showing 
uh, men uh, with a turban uh, in fashion. So again, in, towards the sort of Indian community, this was a very big statement of us to use him in this ad. Carly Scortino is the name of this lady. Um, she's a um, sort of strong voice in the quest for uh, women's sexual liberation. She, she's got a blog on Vo uh, Vice magazine and Vogue magazine. And, uh, she was very important for us in this campaign. As was this lady, her name is Mariah Idrisi. She was the first ever hijab wearing Muslim woman to uh, feature in, in an H&M campaign. Uh, this was kind of our biggest uh, hit in this, in this ad. You know, everyone was chosen carefully, but you don't really know what's going to happen. You hope something's going to happen. This became a very big deal, uh, uh, not only in the Muslim community, um, but in the fashion community. And for Mariah, it was a really big deal. She, she's got a um, hair uh, salon in London, and she became sort of a celebrity overnight. You probably recognize this guy as well. Uh, because you have got to have a celebrity in there somehow. Yeah, it was a very successful campaign. I think it's it, it's a campaign that's successful uh, because it goes beyond being a sort of the 90 second or the 60 second TV spot that we watched, which is really nice on its in its own right. But it was something else. It was something more than that. You have to sort of think beyond that. <clears throat> I'm going to show you another case. This is for an. Uh, insurance company called IF. IF is the biggest insurance company in Northern Europe, in the Northern region. Uh, and we've been working with them for a few years. Um, I don't know if any one of you has ever worked with an, um, with an insurance company. It's tricky because insurance is really boring. If you ask people to make a list of the most boring things they could talk about, they wouldn't even put insurance on that list because it's so boring, they wouldn't even think about it. So how do you sort of make people engage in, in, in such a product? Well, <clears throat> we and, and many others, but we had tried for, for, for years to do it by having very rational sort of uh, ways of communicating, talking about how good if insurance company is when something goes wrong, you know, they'll take care of it, they're fantastic. Really sort of rational, straight ways of communicating it. It didn't work. We realized that even though you might think that insurance is an extremely rational product to sell, it, like pretty much everything else, is an emotional product that people buy simply based on whether they like a company or not. Uh, they don't go into the details, they just need to feel for that company. So we decided to talk to these people in a way that sort of would engage them um, Beyond not, not even trying to, not going from rational to emotional, really, just going from rational to, to something else, to not really talk about ad, um, insurance at all, to create something uh, that people would like, that is relevant to the in insurance industry, to the specific brand, and they would simply focus on building liking, thinking that this is an interesting insurance company. And this is what we did. We go unconscious about driving. We're thinking about what we're going to have for lunch or a meeting we just had. If aja hiljaa navigaattorisovellus on kuin mikä tahansa ääniohjattu navigaattori, vaan sillä pienellä erotuksella, että kun sajat koulujen päiväkotien tai jonkun muun paikan lähellä, jossa on pieniä lapsia, se ääniohjaus muuttuu lapsen ääneksi. Nuor, nuor, te ukannas. We are programmed to care for children. So when you hear a child's voice, it will have that immediate effect of putting you in mind of looking after children. There's an association there already. giving me directions, it will have an immediate visceral, physical, cognitive, behavioral effect. I think it's an excellent idea. Thank 
ensuring our navigation systems are ready. So we would definitely welcome people to steal this idea from us. You have not hit mål. Next thing I'm going to show you is something we did uh, also last year um, for the World Food Program. Uh, this is a campaign that we did together with Zlatan Ibrahimovic, the football player, which I'm, uh, I hope many of you know, because otherwise this campaign doesn't make any sense. Uh, this is what we did. The whole campaign started with Zlatan uh, uh, putting this image, uh, posting this image on his Instagram. Um, you know, Zlatan is famous for his footballing skills, but also for his tattoos. And a lot of people who follow him on social media were quickly aware of the fact that he was wearing a new tattoo. It says Abdullah up his back. And it generated a lot of interest. Just um, two days later, he played a... He didn't... By the way, what we just saw there, he didn't uh, comment. He didn't reply to anything about the, uh, his new tattoo. Two days later, he played a game of football. Uh, and. Uh, a couple of minutes into the game, he scored a goal. Actually, just two minutes into the game, he scored a goal, and then he took his shirt off and gave him a, got a booking for it. But uh, he revealed a torso full of new tattoos, all of them showing names. Uh, this image got sort of became very viral in a very short space of time. Uh, not just viral in social media, also picked up by also traditional media. And people wanted to know what was going on with these tattoos. Uh, Zlatan just said, I'm going to tell you in a couple of days. I'm going to have a press conference in two days, and I'll tell you what this is about. So people turned up to this press conference, and Zlatan said, I'm going to show you a film now to explain a little bit about what this is all about. Um, this is the film that he showed at that press conference. My name is Zlatan Ibrahimovic. Wherever I go, people recognize me. Call my name. Cheer for me. But there are names no one cheers for. Carmen, Rachma, Antoine, Lida, Chewy, Mariko. If I could, I would write every single name on my body. But there are 805 million people suffering from hunger in the world today. Too many of them are children. They are struck by war, natural disasters, and extreme poverty. I have supporters all over the world. Beginning today, I want this support to go to the people who really need it. campaign was really relying on the fact that Zlatan would score a goal. Uh, you know, we built this whole structure around the fact that he would score a goal, and it was, you know, that's kind of scary, but he just said, don't worry, I will score a goal. And he did, you know, under like 100 seconds into the game. So he did, uh, played a very important part in this campaign. 
I'm going to show you one last thing, and, and then I'm done. Thank you for putting up with my voice. It's a bit better now, actually. It's a shame. It's, yeah. oh, was it okay? Have you, has it been understandable? I'm sorry about the voice. It's annoying. I'm going to show you one last thing. This is for a um, skincare brand, SK2. You know, this whole sort of idea of organizing our company um, that I started off talking about, at the moment, we're very excited, and, and the, what we're sort of trying to do now is see if this idea is uh, applicable all over the world. Can we, can we do something with this? Can we expand and do something more? So we were happy when SK2 came to us and asked us to do a campaign for the Chinese market. That's their biggest market. Because uh, it's a very sort of different culture to ours. So it was a huge sort of challenge and task. Uh, this is the sort of the, the, um, the, the, the brief that we got. SK2 wants you to break category language and fill the communication platform Change Destiny. They had a platform called Change Destiny. Fill the communication platform Change Destiny with emotional values and create buzz. It's a nice brief because it's short and tight. But it's difficult because we don't really know that much about Chinese culture. But um, the team that worked on this, they... they uh, uh, spent about six months, I think, uh, researching, traveling to China, trying to understand that market and that culture. And um, two weeks ago, the result was launched, and this is our latest uh, sort of big uh, campaign uh, that you might see online, or might not, because they don't have YouTube in China. So it's on YouTube, but it's on something else in China. But here it is. Not a child. Uh, uh, 不要任性可怜天下父母心爱所以顾林回家是压力最大的因为全部人都会在问你然后可能都是父母人也不是长得太漂亮我就算一个人
，对于自己生活这件事，我是很开心的，然后很自由，我也享受一个人的状态。我女儿很美，圣女很光荣啊！独立着也应该活得很精彩的，这就是我想。他如果觉得，嗯，单身的也蛮好，我们还是会尊重他的。是优秀的女孩啊，圣兰要努力呀、啊。自信，嗯，独立。热爱生活，不错的一位女性。Thank you. That is actually it for me. Thank you. Yes, yes, thank you.